It is a great pleasure, uh, pleasure and privilege to be here. Thanks to Danielle, thanks to Kathleen Merrigan, Diane Knapp, and to all of you for coming and gathering. As Danielle said, as the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs, as the originator of, of Planet Forward, having this conversation here and being a part of it is um, actually a great thrill. And I'm so looking forward, Alice and, and panel, to the conversations that you're going to have. Um, so food, food is a story. And that's what we do here. We tell stories. We teach our students how to tell stories. We think about how we can use the media more effectively and creatively to tell stories, how we can engage an audience which is more shattered, disaggregated is the term we use, than ever because of all these media. It sort of works at cross purposes with itself sometimes. How we tell these stories. Food is a story. It is an economic story. It is a nutrition story. It is an equity and social justice story. It is an aesthetic story. It is a social story. It is a moral story. How do we rationalize wasting a third of our food when we have nearly a billion people confronting food insecurity on this planet? So how do we tell the story better, more effectively? How can you tell the story? Because guess what? You're all storytellers. We're all storytellers. We met Ben Simon earlier today, a remarkable young man, a college student. He saw something. Something bothered him. He went and jumped into action, and he created his remarkable uh, recovery food network to deal with food waste. That's a story. He's a story. We met a farmer at one of our Planet Forward salons by the name of Tom Lithicum. If any of you have driven through Maryland and seen the signs, you've seen signs for Lithicum, Maryland. That's his family. Generations ago, and he's been a farmer for generations as well. And he told his own personal story. We were having a conversation about climate and farming. And we heard from meteorologists and climatologists and people with all sorts of data. And then Tom said, you know what? I'm a farmer. And when I was younger, we would get these long rains in the spring that were sort of misty and they would saturate the earth. And now we get more downpours and the runoff has changed and I've had to build berms and put in new drainage systems. And suddenly he was telling a story and people, especially our students in the room, got it. It wasn't some vague policy conversation as important as the vague and specific policy conversations are. It was about a person doing a real thing to continue to keep his farm in business as a result of changes he has experienced. He brought it to life. A few years ago when I was doing a documentary for CNN, I went down to Brazil and I spent the day, two days actually, with an amazing man um, who was growing sugarcane for sugarcane ethanol in Brazil. And we went through his whole spread and we saw how sugarcane is planted only once every five years as opposed to corn and corn ethanol, which has to be planted every year. Well, that saves the soil because you're not planting it so much. And then when it's cut and burned, they have the bagasse, which is the, the burnt remains, which goes back down and is, as a nutrient for the soil. And because sugarcane is so dense and thick and green and rich, it's a carbon sink. And they were selling carbon credits to a Swedish company. And he went on and on, and it was an unbelievable story that I then finished by driving a rented Chevrolet that was running on his sugarcane ethanol down the road saying, why can't I drive a car like this in the United States of America? It was the best stand-up I've ever done, and I was sitting down behind the wheel of a car. There's a guy by the name of Gary Beck. I met Gary Beck at another <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, gathering. He's a farm manager at Hillside Ranch in Blaine County, Idaho, and he grows barley. What do we use barley for? Beer. Beer. Okay, there's a story. I know I got young people now. <laughs> well, what's, what Gary's been encountering is that in the last 10 years, his aquifer has dropped 50 feet. And he was working with Miller Coors to figure out what was happening and how they could grow that barley with less water because both Gary and Miller Coors needs the water. He was a story. Mary Jenga. Mary Jenga is a postdoctoral fellow in bioenergy. She is Kenyan. She works with women in uh, the most mm, intense 
dense uh, slum in Nairobi, Kibera, to make biomass fuel briquettes to replace wood in indoor cook stoves. Some of our students discovered Mary when they went for Planet Forward to shoot a story. And they brought her back, recorded, <laughs> and edited it into an amazing story. And we so fell in love with the story that we invited Mary to come here. And Mary presented. But then Mary talked to a group of students and she said, she explained how she'd gotten into this. That as a young girl, it was her job with her family every day to go get wood for the cook stove. And she would walk to the woods. And it was an hour away. And as she got older, the woods got farther and farther away because they were being cut down. That by the time she was a young woman, it was a full day trek. And that galvanized her to make, to do something about it and to start making and working with women to make these biomass fuel briquettes. Her story so galvanized the students who were listening to it that they volunteered to do a Kickstarter campaign and to work with her. It made it real, it made it human. There's Kathleen Merrigan, whom my students uh, profiled for an assignment. And she talked to them about organics and how she wrote the law and all the rest. But then what brought the story to life was Kathleen started talking about how she shopped for her family and how you shop from the outside in, in a grocery store, and how you use a farmer's market. All these are examples of stories. We tell our students that the definition of a really great story is pretty simple. Shakespeare knew it. We've known it since the beginning of time. Compelling characters seeking to overcome obstacles to achieve a worthy outcome. Compelling characters overcoming obstacles to achieve a worthy outcome. That's what all of you do. It's what every farmer does every year. It's what people in poverty do to just try to survive. These are stories. So if we are to be more effective at telling the food story, stories, plural, right? Nutritional, agricultural, environmental, you name it. We need to be better storytellers. And we need to be storytellers who do not just focus on the negative or the doom and the gloom, because there's plenty of that, but also on the invention and the innovation and the intellect and the curiosity and the imagination that we bring to this. Because as we've talked to every one of these farmers, to every one of these NGOs, to everyone, not everyone, but most everyone in the private sector, we hear compelling characters trying to overcome obstacles to achieve a worthy outcome. And told right, that's riveting. I said each of us, each of you is a storyteller. How many of you have a Twitter account? Facebook? How many of you post on Facebook? OK, a lot of hands up. We should all have our hands up. Me too. <laughs> we can tell stories through video, through text, through tweets. We tell stories with our friends. We tell stories at work to be more effective. This is the fundamental of communication, I think. There's a very interesting game I play with my students to try to make it real. And I'll play it with you here very quickly. I call it the grandma game. And those of you who've hung around with me have heard me tell this before, so please excuse me. So let's start with a contest. Who thinks they have the oldest grandma in the room? Who's got an old grandma alive? How old is your grandma? 95. That's pretty good. Anybody older? Okay, so 95. So you got, so here's the game. You got great DNA. Are you a student? Recent student. Oh, sure. <laughs> so you've got great DNA in your family. If you live to 95, what year is that? Take your birth year, add 100, subtract 5. <laughs> I'm, I'm, helping, I'm helping you here. You can do this. I know you can do this. <laughs> what year were you born? 1969. So you would live to, that would be 2065. 2065. I play it with my students. Most of them were born in 1995. 1990, it's scary. That means they're going to, they could be seeing 2085. Their kids, 2110, 2120, who knows? I say to them, 
for you, 2050, 9 billion people on the planet, is tomorrow. How we feed them, how we clothe them, how we water them, that's our challenge. That's your story. You're a compelling character. Go overcome the obstacles. Thank you.